from uh, University of Maryland College Park. Take it away. Thank you. Thank you so much for having me here today. So in this talk, we are going to learn about how do we make machine learning algorithms fair, explainable, and lawful using approaches from information theory. Okay, so the motivation for this research comes from the growing use of machine learning in these really high stakes applications like hiring, education, lending, healthcare, etc. For instance, more than 50% of companies are using algorithms at some stages in their hiring pipeline. Similar algorithms are widely used in lending and for credit decision making, etc. So while these algorithms are really good at learning all patterns present in the data, but blindly learning all patterns can sometimes have unintended consequences, like propagating biases and disparities with respect to gender, race, age, nationality, etc. Or sometimes taking decisions that we do not quite know or understand why that decision was taken or what we could do to avert the outcome. So my research interests lie uh, at the intersection of fairness, explainability, and policy. And towards answering these urgent questions, uh, what uh, I propose is techniques that use information theory, uh, statistics, and causality. So in explainability, the questions that I'm interested in are, how do we provide not just any explanation, but explanations that can reliably guide towards changing the outcome of a model? And then in algorithmic fairness, the kind of questions that I've been looking into is how do we quantify not just disparity, but the sources of disparity, like which feature or attribute is actually responsible for causing the disparities in the model. And to answer these questions, in today's talk, I will talk about some of my recent works in this uh, area. I will be spending more time on our recent work on robust counterfactual explanations. So what are counterfactual explanations? Let's say you apply for a loan and the loan gets rejected and we would want to tell the customer or applicant what they need to do to be accepted for the loan. So counterfactual explanations become the closest point on the other side of the decision boundary that is getting accepted by a model. Like increase your income by 10K and then you will be accepted for this loan. But then what happens is that all of these machine learning models being used to make these decisions are updated quite frequently. Sometimes they might be updated due to retraining on a few additional data points, or they might be retrained using some uh, on an additional seed or changing the hyperparameter. And then the models can change. And when these models change, sometimes these counterfactual explanations can become invalid. Like you tell the uh, applicant to increase their income by 10K and they actually do it and come back. But now because your model has updated, the counterfactual explanation is still not valid and they are still getting rejected for, for the loan. So the question that we ask over here is, how do we provide counterfactual explanations that are not only close, but also robust to these kinds of model changes? So this is the problem statement that we're given a data point X that is getting rejected by the model. So MX is the model outcome, which gives a value between zero and one. So less than 0.5 means you're getting rejected. Then the goal is to find another point or a counterfactual X prime, which will be accepted by this model. And also it will satisfy some of these other requirements. Like it is as close to the old point as possible. It's also going to remain valid after changes to the model. And then the third requirement is it should also be a more realistic point with respect to the data manifold. Like you can't change people, ask people to change something that they cannot change, like change your city of birth or something like that. So uh, to, answer, uh, to solve this problem statement, uh, our main contribution that I'm going to talk about is a measure or quantification of counterfactual stability, which quantifies, yes. Uh, so one and three are not the same. Uh, no, one is just close, just you cross the boundary, but three is realistic means it should be also related to the data points or lie in a more dense region of the data point, data manifold. A good question. So we're going to propose a measure of counterfactual stability, which quantifies the robustness of these uh, uh, counterfactuals under natural model changes with probabilistic guarantees. So I started looking at this problem while I was at JP Morgan, where they were more interested in tree-based models, which are non-differentiable. 
But now we are also looking into neural networks, which are inherently differentiable. And for differentiable models, we find that the model's local Lipschitz behavior actually plays an important role in uh, determining whether the point is going to be robust or not. So this is joint work with my PhD student, Faisal uh, Irfan, who is another PhD student at UMD. And Somitra and Danielle are with the explainability team at JP Morgan. Okay, so what is this measure of counterfactual stability? So before defining counterfactual stability, we are trying to axiomatically think through what would be the desirable properties for such a measure of counterfactual stability. So one desirable property would be, of course, if the model output is a value between zero and one, if the output value is high, like if it's 0.6 or 0.7, we might think that, okay, this, count, this value is, uh, or this point is more likely to remain stable and valid after model changes. But then we find that just high output value may not be enough. So the second property is that if several points around the point that we are interested in have a high model output value, then that would make the point more stable and less likely to be invalidated. But then uh, the third thing that we look at is just high local mean is also not enough. So you might also want low variability in the region where the point is located. So we are seeking high local mean value and low local variability. So these, these three properties lead us to propose this uh, measure of counterfactual stability, which looks something like this. So for a counterfactual point, we would generate a bunch of Gaussian points around it, and then we would compute its mean value. So high local mean and low local variability, where this is the Lipschitz constant of the model. Okay, so now we have a measure of counterfactual stability. How do we say whether this is a good measure or what kind of guarantees can we give for this measure? So to give guarantees on the robustness or validity, first we have to think through what kind of model changes are we really interested in because models can change drastically and there can be a lot of different kinds of changes that could happen to a model. So to understand this, we propose this abstraction of naturally occurring model change so what is naturally occurring model change? So to give some background, these are some related works on robustness of counterfactuals. So in existing works, uh, an assumption that is made is that the old model and the new model are bounded in the parameter space. Like if it's a new neural network, the two neural networks parameters are bounded by some delta. And then they also go on to apply uh, minimax uh, optimization problems to solve uh, or to find robust counterfactuals. But our assumptions come from this observation that these models can actually change quite a lot in the parameter space, but uh, they, their uh, output values on the data set doesn't change a whole lot. This idea also relates to a body of work called Rashomon effect, which deals with the properties of uh, models making similar decisions on a data set. So based on these observations, this is our proposed abstraction of this naturally occurring model change. So visually, this is how it looks. What we are saying is that the new model is going to be centered around the old model's output value. Then the second assumption we make is that the, if the old model is Lipschitz, then the new model is also going to be Lipschitz. And then the third assumption that we make is this variance assumption that on the points that lie actually on the data manifold, the variability of the new model is going to be less. So the points that actually lie on the dense regions of the data manifold are somewhat acting like anchors, while in the other regions or sparse regions of the data manifold, the changed model can actually vary a lot. And then under these assumptions of naturally occurring model change, we are able to give probabilistic guarantees on our measure of robustness. So the guarantee looks something like this, that under naturally occurring model change, the new model's output is going to be greater than our proposed robustness measure with a high probability. And then if the new model's output is going to be higher than our proposed robustness measure, then we can use the proposed robustness measure as a reliable lower bound for the output of the new model. So if the robustness value is high, then we would expect the change model's output to also be high and hence the point will be more likely to be accepted uh, or lie on the accepted side of the data manifold. The proof of this uses concentration bounds for Lipschitz functions of Gaussian random variables. 
Okay, so now we have a measure and then how do we integrate this measure into an algorithm? So in our algorithm, we introduce this concept called conservative counterfactuals. So uh, to give a sense here, if this is the rejected applicant. So the closest counterfactual will be A, which is just the closest point on the other side. The closest data support or realistic counterfactual will be B, which is on the other side and also on the data manifold. And then the conservative counterfactual is something like this, which is, uh, also, which is on the data manifold, which is on the accepted side and also somewhat well within the decision boundary. And then we're also able to incorporate uh, relaxations of this measure uh, into an optimization formulation and propose an algorithm called T-Rex which is a theoretically robust explanations. <laughs> and uh, yes, I think in the optimization formulation, what we do is we are able to incorporate this robustness measure as a constraint in the optimization, and then we can solve for it, yes. I'm gonna ask a super awkward question. Can you for a moment, take a minute to explain what counterfactual means in the fairness literature? Please. Yeah, that's true. So this is uh, explainable in literature. Uh, so here counterfactual in this context means, let's say I apply for a loan and I get rejected. So what is a hypothetical point which will be accepted by the model? So in causality, counterfactual is used in the sense that if I give this drug to a patient and the patient dies, if I had hypothetically not given the drug, what would have happened? So here the word is used in that sense that if I had increased my income by 10K, if I had 10K more, then I would get accepted by the model. So it's like the nearest point, not nearest, a point on the other side, which is going to get accepted by the model. So in some sense, I want to poison the data to get fairer result. I, I, I'm trying to understand because you're, you're assuming the model changes. No, the so I'm not retraining the model. Uh, the model is going to be fixed. With respect to this model, what do you need to do to be accepted? But then the model can change without consideration for that counterfactual that was given. It can change due to various internal reasons, like you might retrain it on some additional data points or change the seed or hyperparameter. So the changed model is not related to the explanation that was given. Thank you. Thanks. Okay, so then with this algorithm, uh, we also have several experimental results. Uh, I'm not including all the details here, but uh, to summarize, we propose a quantification of counterfactual stability with probabilistic guarantees. We also have some impossibility results for targeted model changes. Like, so what I'm saying is that with high probability among these naturally occurring model changes, you will be reliable, but it doesn't mean you cannot deliberately construct some targeted model changes for which you will uh, fail. And then our algorithm is able to find counterfactuals that are quite close, robust, and realistic. We have experimental data uh, results on many other tabular data sets. And this also outperforms some of the min-max optimization type approaches that I had talked about before. So, to, uh, so some of the ongoing problems that we are looking into are we are trying to look into uh, making counterfactuals robust and realistic over time if there's a time evolving model. And also I'm interested in privacy and fairness problems for counterfactuals. Okay, so uh, switching gears a little bit. Now I will be talking about uh, my work on fairness where the question that I'm interested in is, how do we identify and explain the sources of disparity? Like which feature or attribute is more responsible for the disparity in a model? So this is the setting that we are thinking about. So we have a bunch of features going into a model and taking decisions on acceptance or rejection. And then uh, sometimes what happens is that, let's say this is an application for, uh, this is an example of hiring a software engineer for a very safety critical application. Some features might be deemed more important than others. Like coding test might be deemed as more important for hiring a software engineer. And this is also a question that the courts care about today like uh, disparate impact or disparity may be exempt if it can be justified by something called an occupational necessity. Like coding test may be deemed as an occupational necessity for a software engineering job or weight lifting may be an occupational necessity for firefighters so that they can lift victims out of a building. But then other features like aptitude test may not be deemed as a critical feature uh, as in this landmark court case of Griggs versus Duke Power. So the question that we are asking here is, given a choice of critical features, which is given to us by a domain expert or a lawyer, 
how do we say if the disparity that you're observing is exempt or non-exempt? So our contribution is a systematic measure of non-exempt disparity, which is the bias or disparity that is not justified by the critical features. So again, the problem statement or notations are going to be as follows. Uh, we have these bunch of features x1, x2, x3, y hat is the model output, z denotes the protected attribute like gender, race, etc. The critical features are denoted by xc and the non-critical or general features are denoted by xg. And then we also assume that all of these data, and this is an assumption in fairness literature, that all of these uh, features x1, x2, x3 are generated from an underlying data generation process or structural causal model where you have some of these latent random variables that you do not get to see, u1, u2, u3. Uh, and this sensitive attribute is z, which is gender, race, etc. Then uh, the question is, given a choice of critical features, what is a good measure of this non-exempt disparity? So once you have a measure, it could be used in different ways, either for auditing or for training, where you can use this non-exempt disparity as a regularizer with a loss function. The question that we are interested in is a more definitional question that what is a good measure of this non-exempt disparity? So I'll talk briefly about some of the popular definitions of fairness, which is statistical parity and equalized odds. So statistical parity is something that you might be familiar with, which is says that the output is fair if it's entirely independent of the sensitive attribute Z. And you can write statistical parity as mutual information, statistical disparity as mutual information. But the criticism for statistical parity is that it sometimes disregards the critical necessities. Like if the coding test happens to be correlated with Z, this is a model that you would get without using any kind of fairness regularizer. But when you use a fairness regularizer, which minimizes statistical parity to minimize the correlation with Z and the output, you might end up not placing any importance on the coding test score, and you might be taking decisions entirely on a non-critical feature. To address this problem with statistical parity, another definition is equalized odds, which says that the output is independent, uh, that Z and Y hat should be independent, conditioned on the true labels or uh, the past labels. And a perfect classifier satisfies equalized odds. So if a classifier is 100% accuracy, it will satisfy equalized odds. But equalized odds has also faced some criticism that let's say we're accepting everybody in the past, everyone who has been above a threshold have been accepted and we are still continuing to give a perfect classifier which accepts all of them. But then here in this scenario, uh, the coding test score might not be correlated with Z, but the aptitude test score happens to be correlated with Z. And then there's a lot of discussion on even though we are getting a perfect classifier, it is the aptitude test score which is propagating the correlation. And aptitude test score is not a critical feature. So uh, this leads to a lot of debate and discussion. And our approach actually adopts a middle ground between statistical parity and equalized odds using domain knowledge. Where we first assume that we have the critical features given to us. And then our question becomes, what is a good measure of non-exempt disparity? So now I'm going to talk about some candidate measures that we look into. So one candidate measure that we might think of is conditional mutual information or conditional independence. That uh, for the, the, the model is fair if the output y hat is independent of z conditioned on the critical feature like coding test score. And uh, the information theoretic quantification of this measure is conditional mutual information, which is a mutual information between z and y hat conditioned on xc. But then one observation that we make in this work is that conditional dependence can also sometimes falsely detect dependencies, even when a model is causally fair. So to understand this, I'm going to look into a counter example now. So this is, we are going to look into an example of causally fair model. So here Z is the protected attribute and U is a latent random variable that is independent of Z, which could denote something like inner ability. Then the coding test score happens to depend on both Z and U. And then the other features are probably depending only on U. And let's say the model is able to distill out this U from all of these features and take its decisions based entirely on just U and not on Z. 
So by causal definitions of fairness in existing works, this model will be deemed fair because it says that a counterfactual fairness or causal fairness, this counterfactual is different from the other counterfactual. But counterfactual fairness says that uh, the output Z doesn't vary with Z after fixing all the latent random variables U. So here what's going on is that we have uh, Z is independent of Y hat. So the output is independent of Z. But when you condition on this critical feature XC, it becomes dependent. This also relates to classical information theory examples and mutual information is greater than zero, but uh, condition mutual information is greater than zero, but uh, inf mutual information is not. So this issue leads to one desirable property that we want our measure of non-exam disparity to be zero, even when a model is causally fair. So we see that conditional mutual information does not satisfy this causal fairness property. And it is this limitation of conditional mutual information which leads us to look into a body of work in information theory, which is called partial information decomposition. What partial information decomposition does is it further decomposes conditional mutual information into two quantities called unique information and synergistic information. And then it is this unique information measure actually satisfies our causal fairness property as well as some others. So what is this unique information? We look at two very similar looking examples here. In the first case, the critical feature is Z plus U, but the output is U. So the output has no information about protected attribute Z, in which case this is causally fair. But in the second case, the critical feature is U, but the output is Z plus U. So the output has some information about this Z that is not arising from the critical feature X. And conditional dependence or conditional mutual information is greater than zero for both these examples. So ideally we are looking for a measure here that is able to distinguish between these two scenarios. And unique information enables that. So what unique information does is, uh, so it's the conditional mutual information between these random variables when only the marginals between z y hat and z x c are preserved, but the joint distribution of the three random variables are allowed to vary. And this also has a Venn diagram interpretation where if you have mutual information and conditional mutual information, unique information happens to be the intersectional region between mutual information and conditional mutual information that also satisfies our causal fairness property as well as some other properties. Okay, so uh, to summarize, we started out with statistical disparity and mutual information, which is the entire correlation between Z, Y hat, but then this does not allow exemptions for business necessities or critical features. So we tried conditional dependence, but then for conditional dependence there's a region which lies outside of mutual information. That is, it can sometimes be non-zero even when mutual information is zero. So we propose unique information as uh, a candidate measure of non exam disparity. And this satisfies several desirable properties too that I already talked about, as well as the natural monotonicity properties as well, which actually conditional mutual information doesn't satisfy. So the monotonicity properties are something like if all features are critical, then it will go to zero. As you add drop more and more features from the critical set, it will be monotonically increasing. And if no feature is critical, it will become the conditional, uh, the, the mutual information. Then there are some more nuanced issues and I'll be a bit quick from here that even unique information doesn't address, which is this example of masking. So this is like, let's say an ad is shown to women with men with high inner ability and women with low inner ability, and it is not shown to these two other fractions of people. So here the output is an XOR of Z and U which will be independent, but then there's some causal dependence uh, between Z and this output Y hat, which is not desirable because the ad is not being shown to women with high inner ability who actually uh, might qualify for this job, but they do not get to see the ad. So here, uh, this kind of disparity is called mass disparity. And for mass disparity, we have some impossibility results that a purely observational measure might not be able to ca correctly capture mass disparity in a lot of situations. And even in causality, these have connections with non-faithful causal models. And then we also propose a causal measure that satisfies not only five, but six desirable properties, including this, uh, this scenario of mass disparities. 
So our observational measure is a lower bound to our proposed causal measure that satisfies six desirable properties. But this causal measure requires knowledge of the structural causal model and the relationships, which may or may not always be available. So we also have some experimental results. Uh, so for when we want a scenario where the causal relationships are known, we start with synthetic data. For synthetic data, we are able to use all of these measures as regularizers with the loss function and see how accuracy and fairness trade off with each other. So we have the total disparity, which is decomposed into exempt and non-exempt disparity. And this is further decomposed into masked and visible and similarly masked, visible, non-exempt uh, disparities. And when the causal relationships are not known, we cannot compute the causal measure that I proposed. But what we can do is we can still use all of these regularizers that have been proposed, uh, the observational regularizers. And under certain assumptions on faithfulness, uh, these measures do capture a lot of the scenarios that I talked about. Then we also have some other work which uh, in incorporates these measures on Twitter data and tries to quantify exempt and non-exempt topic biases. Then a related question that falls out is what is the potential contribution of each individual feature? Like you don't just have critical or non-critical features, but now you have a large number of features and you want to quantify what is the contribution of each of those features to the disparity. Then while I was at CMU, I also collected a graduate admissions data set and applied some of these partial information decomposition measures on that data set to see how which feature is having unique contribution and which feature is having synergistic contribution on the uh, feature on the features uh, on the disparity of the decisions. I'll very briefly talk about some other related and ongoing research. We are also interested in the problem of accuracy and fairness trade-offs, where in my prior work, I used a technique from Chernoff information to quantify the trade-offs between accuracy and fairness. And this Chernoff information technique can also be used uh, to understand if some features are missing or if some features are not providing enough information to separate the two features. How can you choose features or when choosing new features help and when choosing new features doesn't help? And now we are also looking into extending this partial information decomposition kind of ideas in local and global fairness settings in federated learning. This is a work in preparation, but in federated learning, the situation becomes that there's a local fairness and a global fairness because every uh, every uh, every node is acting on its own local data set, but at the central level, there's also a global data set with which you have to ensure fairness. And then uh, these are some works that started while I was at JP Morgan. Uh, so in the finance setting, there's another, uh, the restrictions of the regulations in for fairness are a little bit different. So what they want is that the model developers who are developing or training the model should not have direct access to the sensitive attribute. So the sensitive attribute row or column is missing. And then this problem is addressed from various perspectives. Sometimes people allow a separation between model developers and a compliance team where the compliance team might have the entire data set, but the model developers don't. And some of these techniques have also been introduced in a feature selection for fairness problem, which is uh, also being used in the fair lending pipeline at JP Morgan. But uh, there is a lot more to do here at the intersection of fairness and explainability. So we'll conclude with my research vision, which is to build the foundations of reliable machine learning using techniques from information and coding theory, causality and probability and statistics, and then connecting it to applications that directly influence people's lives like hiring, education, finance, uh, as well as some other applications that I'm quite interested in. So thank you so much. Any questions? Thank you for the nice talk. Um, on your first and the first part, have you thought about connecting with the recourse literature? Um, because it, it seems like these methods are very effective to give folks uh, recourse. When yeah, yeah. So I think yeah, the goal of counterfactual estimations is to give recourse. So I think uh, it's called algorithmic recourse in some literature. Yeah. It's called counterfactual fairness in some. But yeah, the goal is to tell people that this is what you need to do to get to the other side. But this is what you need to do to also get to the other side in a more reliable manner. Like. Like say someone is giving an exam and say the pass marks is 40. I don't want to tell them just get 41. I want to tell them get maybe 50 or 
be a little bit well within the boundary so that you can reliably pass the test or qualify for the program. And, and a second question is, that, and there's a lot of literature on certifying robustness mm -hmm. uh, models. I understand that here it's, um, it's somewhat in similar spirit. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's a very good question. So in certifying robustness literature, yeah, it's like they generate points around the model, uh, around the data point, uh, and try to give robustness guarantees. But I think the difference with this approach and robustness literature is that there, uh, the perturbations here, the perturbations in the min-max approaches, the perturbations are applied on the model. Uh, like for the neural network, you would want to perturb it with the worst delta. Yeah. But here the perturbations are, uh, sorry, I think I misspoke. So in, in robustness literature, the perturbations are applied on the data point, like mm -hmm. around X, how much would you perturb it with? And then you train the model. But here the perturbations are applied on the model, like for a model, what is the worst case perturbation for that model? And then they apply min-max approaches. And what we are doing is we are not even applying min-max approaches. We are looking at this kind of a probabilistic perspective where you can just do optimization, not in mass optimization and get, uh, I guess, guarantees for a large number of models, not like worst case delta models. Is this a uniform bound for the samples or a guarantee on the sample because of the model perturbation, right? Yeah. yeah. So is that averaged over all the samples? Yeah, or? so we assume both the M is also a random variable and X is also a random variable. So the model is also random and the, sam the samples are also random. One. Uh, great talk. So there is this paper from a couple of years ago from Victor Bitch and others that shows that uh, counterfactual fairness is equivalent to demographic parity for a causal model yeah. and for a anti causal model, it's equivalent to clinical network. In practice, what happens is that most of the time, what's the notion of fairness that's used is equal opportunity. And I'm wondering if, if there is any kind of connection in the yeah, yeah. So equal opportunity is uh, equalized dots and equal opportunity are connected. They're like uh, Z and Y hat should be independent of each other, conditioned on the true label Y or condition of the historic label Y. So equalized odds, it would also translate to having equal accuracy on uh, all groups when you actually train the model. But the criticism with equalized odds is that equalized odds as it uses the past labels that you already have. Like in the past, who has been successful, you have the data for that. So it conditions on those true labels that it already has that in the past who has been successful, but in the past who has been successful, it can also encode a lot of label bias, which is not specifically looked at. And ideally, we would want to have an equalized odds where we have the future <coughs> labels for who will be successful in future. But that is something we don't have. So when we use the past labels to do that, then past label bias propagates. And then there are all of these issues that which feature was responsible for the disparity and which feature was not. Which is why I think a more explainability plus fairness kind of approach uh, is, is going to be useful. I have one. Um, so this uh, unique mutual information thing, uh, how difficult is it to, to empirically estimate this thing? Yeah, that's a good question. That's something I was expecting. So what uh, once you have the marginal distributions, not the marginal actually, just the joint distributions, then it becomes a convex optimization problem. But the challenge is how do you reliably get these joint uh, distributions? And again, for discrete random variables, there are some nice things you can do. For Gaussian random variables, there are some nice results. Uh, so, and here, so far we have used simpler techniques because Z and Y hat were binary and XC was also somewhat uh, like easy feature. But uh, it is a problem that I'm looking into. And I think there's possibility of using other techniques here. Maybe uh, there's this work on mutual information, neural estimation, mind, and some things along those lines. I think I also, there could be other techniques also what Lalita was talking about in her talk. And I think also some optimal trans transport <laughs> was a nice talk in the morning. So I think there is possibility of uh, using other techniques to get uh, improved estimators. Thank you so much.